Okay, uh, let's kick off. Uh, we'll get started to today. I just uh, want to make sure that uh, we uh, get through the session. I know that uh, you know folks have uh, committed this time to us and really appreciate that. So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this month's webinar. And so, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend it here with us. Uh, we know and appreciate that there are a lot of competing things in your calendar. And so, uh, uh, yeah, really uh, uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us uh, on this month's webinar. Uh, and so, in in uh, in uh, our Wallery.ai webinar for this month, uh, we're going to walk through uh, our new uh, Databricks notebook integration. And uh, with this integration, uh, we'll see that uh, data scientists, ML engineers, and the teams that you're working with uh, in Azure Databricks, you know, have that sort of easy button for deployment, for pipeline management, and that tight integration with your Databricks uh, ecosystem for security, authentication, uh, authorization, and also data access as well. And we'll get a chance to see where Wallaroo fits in uh, to the production ML process from uh, initiation, ideation, right through to production and post-production as well. And we'll get a chance to see this in a, a demo environment, like a day in the life of, uh, with uh, my colleague Jeff and um, so what we want to do uh, throughout the session is we want to keep this interactive uh, as well so we have opportunity within uh, the tool here to uh, add in questions uh, via the chat function and uh, we've carved out time at the end for uh, us to you know have some Q&A and get to your questions so appreciate if you have any questions uh, please uh, drop them into that chat function we're also recording this video, uh, so if the, your colleagues couldn't make this, or you have teams of folks uh, that uh, I mean, maybe you know couldn't attend today, uh, we'll we are recording this, and we'll put this up onto our YouTube channel. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, go up there and uh, and check out not just uh, this recording, but we have a number of other uh, tutorials and and other recordings that help you get your ML models into production uh, using Wallaroo. So. My name is uh, Martin Bolt. I am the uh, Senior Community Manager at Wallaroo.ai, and uh, I have been in the business for, fortunately, for over 25 years, and uh, working with and engaging with uh, uh, technical practitioners like yourselves is uh, it's been the highlight uh, of, you know, that, that, that career journey for me. And, uh, and so, you know, getting through, uh, you, know, and, uh, you know, hearing about how you're using uh, ML and AI to solve business problems and challenges using the technology uh, is is a is a great thrill for me to hear that you know that brain trust that, that that folks have. And when we think about that production ML and getting those AI and ML models into into production, you know how does how does Wallaroo fit into this space? Uh, and so essentially, uh, you know, businesses uh, have made investments in tools you know, to help facilitate uh, the, the prepping, the developing uh, of models. Uh, however, we uh, have seen uh, reports, and there's a lot of stats from Gartner, et cetera, uh, and the other analysts that uh, businesses often struggle to get these models into production. Uh, Wallaroo, it's the, the only unified uh, platform for that production machine learning. And what it does is it helps solve that operational challenge that businesses face for production ML so that you and your teams can stay focused on the right business outcomes without becoming mired in uh, you know tool uh, you know not tools not talking to each other uh, you know processes breaking down uh, and then silos uh, within the organization and so through Wallaroo uh, the DNA that is built into the platform is to get your uh, ML uh, projects to help deliver those results you know faster easier and also with a far lower investment than uh, than you know is typically experienced uh, in this space and we do this by streamlining uh, and deploying you know through deployment through running uh, the models through observability and those parts of the ml life cycle and giving the data scientists and the ml uh, engineers the freedom to use the tools that they already know and I'll talk about this a few times. Uh, it's it's important in any investment that an organisation makes in technology to uh, to give their people an environment that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable 
and operating with and working with on a day-to-day -day basis. If we can't give them that, that adds an additional cost uh, to the acquisition of that technology. It involves uh, training, it involves uh, you know, different processes and so on. And so that, that, uh, that uh, ability for Wallaroo to slot right in uh, to those inv existing investments and then leverage the, the investments and that integration has been uh, super important. And that deep integration uh, allows organizations to you know, get into uh, you know, adding you know, industrial grade production workflows to your existing uh, Databricks or you know, cloud ML tooling and just using one or two lines of Python. And so the, you know, the Wallaroo uh, production ML platform integrates with those existing tools, as I mentioned, into your ecosystem. And so it slots into that process. And the, the, the downstream benefit is you know, a faster ROI uh, for AI-enabled uh, initiatives and driving those strategic outcomes, getting them into production faster uh, and making sure that they are uh, you know, paying back and giving the results that are intended back to the business. And so uh, the other element within uh, uh, the DNA of, uh, of uh, the Wallaroo production ML platform is that we also deploy to three major clouds, uh, you know, Azure, AWS, and GCP. And if you're also uh, in an environment of uh, on-premises or hybrid, we could cater to that as well. And with the advent and the growing space of AI at the edge, uh, we, we uh, cater to that. Uh, that uh, use case as well. And so we have other, uh, uh, if you've seen the webinar from a month or so ago, uh, it's up on our YouTube channel. Uh, go and have a look at how uh, we think about AI at the edge and, and how we help organize, uh, organizations realize uh, AI at the edge deployments as well. And so when we talk about this integration, uh, uh, AI uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the Databricks integration, you know, uh, Databricks is one of these tools that businesses have made uh, investments in, you know, from uh, it helps with solutions from BI through the machine learning process to help store, clean, share, and analyze uh, you know, models and help monetize those data assets. And Azure Databricks, you know, it can be used and is used in that machine a learning process to train models, to track training parameters and models you know, using existing experiments. And this is where Wallaroo is especially powerful with that integration uh, capability in that when paired with Databricks, it helps pick up from where Databricks leaves off in that you already have your connections to your data stores, your model registries and your repos. And in, in that ML lifecycle, uh, you know, Databricks is great at, at loading and prepping that data and getting those data sources uh, up to, uh, you know, the, the point where, you know, you, you want to get into production. And the integration with Wallaroo takes it uh, that last mile uh, through uh, a number of different capabilities uh, and, and powerful features through providing that self-serve deployment uh, directly from a notebook by providing the model monitoring, management and orchestration for things like uh, running A-B tests or shadow deploy while they're in production without having to take down that environment or dehydrate that instance and then start all over again. Once you're in production, you can uh, do this uh, seamlessly within that production environment. And so, uh, and so that pre-work that uh, is invested uh, with Databricks can be leveraged right through into uh, the production deployment uh, capabilities that Wallaroo offers. And it ensures that tight feedback loop you know, with the appropriate uh, corrective and preventative actions across you know, your training, production environments, as models uh, you know, in cases you know, it might present anomalies or uh, data drift. And so when we look at the, uh, the entire uh, ML lifecycle, uh, this is where uh, we, we uh, consciously have developed a product to help deliver that scale uh, by you know, creating those repeatable production model operations processes, making it easy for folks to, to learn you know, by allowing you to deploy models using Wallaroo, uh, using those existing tools that you know, I talked about, you know, familiarity uh, is super important. 
And it also helps bring the, the efficiency and that business continuity through that by using uh, those tools. And that helps reduce uh, change management uh, and overhead for production ML. It's super important as uh, we talk about, uh, you know, great, you know, we can get this uh, model into production quicker and driving uh, that is that operation of efficiency so that, you know, the tools, uh, you know, they don't need to change between phases. If you have a different use cases, you're not having to go out of band or creating a new process for a different model application and deployment. It slots right into uh, that, uh, that, uh, that process. It's also equally important uh, you know, when uh, not just you know for a tool familiarity, but also bringing the teams together that work on uh, ML uh, model uh, production, bringing the data scientists and the ML engineers into a platform where they can collaborate together and breaking down those silos that we traditionally see that hinder uh, production ML success uh, by organizations. And another important element is scale. Uh, companies are not just deploying, you know, one or two models. And so, by uh, you know, as you increase that model production process and the model, uh, uh, you know, load uh, within your systems, your your data scientists and the folks that are working with this, they're not becoming bogged down, you know, by maintenance, and that that detracts from that value generation. The other element that's super important is uh, is you know post production. You know, as I, I mentioned in one of the previous slides, the ability to monitor, observe for uh, things like you know model degradation, you know model uh, drift, uh, and so having the the power to observe that, the power to you know, take action on that proactively uh, is a very valuable because again that keeps uh, the models uh, production, it keeps them uh, returning that value back to the business and it frees up the time of the people working uh, within those projects to then you know, go back into that ideation and that model development phase to, to fine tune uh, the uh, other models and that, that processes as well. And so uh, this is all great, uh, but uh, we get a chance now to see this in action. So my colleague Jeff is going to sort of walk through a day in the life of uh, you know a data scientist uh, working within uh, Azure DataBricks, and so you know taking that model in an environment that they're familiar with straight through uh, into uh, production uh, without uh, any uh, uh, delay or or processes there. Jeff, uh, over to you. So Jeff's just going to share out his screen and uh, he'll walk us through uh, an example uh, of using the Waller SDK integrated right into uh, Databricks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, had a little bit of a spinning problem there. So let me share my screen real quick. This should work. Can you all see Azure Databricks over here? Nope. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Uh, well, sorry, I see one of your documents. So yeah, that's not the right one. <laughs> um, I think yeah, there's just a drop down. You can pick a different uh, screen, like screen two, if you've got multiple monitors going. Here we go. That one. There we go. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Thank you, Martin, and everyone for showing up today. I'm really excited to show this full model lifecycle to y'all. My name is Jeff Will. Uh, I'm a senior product manager here at Wallaroo. A little bit of background, uh, been in product management and data products going on about 10 years, I worked across industries, oil and gas, law, automotive, energy, varying levels of uh, machine learning, as you might suspect, given where those different industries exist in uh, maturity. So um, I want to walk you all through today uh, what it looks like to do a full model life cycle in production. So uh, Martin had said, you know, a day in the life, maybe this is more like a quarter in the life or a year in the life, depending on how quickly we're iterating on our models here. But I want to show you what it looks like to do full life cycle within production. So um, we're going to start off today creating uh, a workspace, as we call it in Wallaroo. I'll, I'll get into this uh, and upload a model, establish our pipeline, um, and then perform some inferences, look at our distribution um, and establish some drift detection. We'll then detect drift, 
and grab a couple of more pre-trained models that we've got for the purposes of this demo, do a shadow deploy, see which model's performing better, and then hot swap out that better performing model into our original pipeline. So that is kind of a, a full life cycle of first deployment. We don't think it's performing the way we want it to. Let's see which one's performing better and switch a better one in. So with that, uh, I am going to start in my Azure Databricks environment here. A couple of things I've done ahead of time. One, I've got my uh, cluster attached. Two, I've got a repo connected to this. So you'll see all of that happening throughout the notebook. Um, and three, I've installed our Wallaroo SDK via PyPy. So that is available out on the interwebs uh, and each cluster in Azure Databricks can install whichever library. So that just is here and ready to go for me within my notebook environment. So first and foremost, uh, we are gonna establish some of our uh, variables importing Wallaroo, uh, general library support, things like that. Um, and then we are going to connect to our Wallaroo instance. So I've identified a couple of variables here just to make it uh, easier to connect. We are using a cluster called Sparkly Apple, as we affectionately call it internally. Um, if I needed to renew my credentials, it would have popped up with a link here and I can go and log in and connect and then come back to my notebook. So I've already got my credentials stored though, so it's not prompting me for that. And then we're gonna jump into our actual Wallaroo uh, specific stuff here. So I'm defining my workspace name as my house price demo web. My pipeline that I will create later is our house price pipeline and our model is our V1 in, in agreement with our story here. And this is my connected repo and where the model is located, right? All that is wonderful. So um, to give you guys some uh, groundwork here, the our workspace is our collaborative environment within Wallaroo. So you can add uh, collaborators to that. You can promote people to owners or collaborators. It's our access control method um, akin to what you have in Databricks. Um, then our pipeline is what we like to think of as model workflows. So they definitely contain one or more models, but they can also have other Python modules, uh, pre-processing and post-processing most notably. Um, we're not gonna show that in depth today, but wanted to make sure we talked about that a little bit. And then we have our model itself. So we're gonna do a simple pipeline with just one model step today. I am going to define my workspace function here and set my workspace. So you will see that we are in our house price demo web workspace that'll come up later once I show you guys the UI a bit. Um, and we're going to upload our model. So I've got this pre-trained -pre model. This again is mimicking the fact that you've done your experimentation. You think you've got a, business, a model that delivers business value and business impact. So this is my command to upload to Wallaroo. Very straightforward, upload the model, give me the name, give me the location. Um, and in this case, we add a dot configure. There's a couple parameters there. We don't need to specify, we can use defaults for now. So. That means that that is now in our environment, in our Wallaroo environment. So next step, let's add it to a pipeline so we can start inferencing. So this is also, I'm gonna start this command. This is also one of the really cool things we think uh, about Wallaroo. So I just built my pipeline using my pipeline name. I added a single model step using my house uh, pricing model um, and I deployed it. And that took me under three seconds to do all of that in a single line as well. So we think that really uh, empowers the data scientists to get these things into production much quicker than um, sometimes having to toss it over a fence and uh, get someone else to build all the infrastructure around it. So, um, and this happens, uh, this also gets taken advantage of when we do our shadow deploy and other things in our lifecycle process. So I am gonna just show a couple of working inferences here. So take my word for it that these are the correct inputs to our house pricing model. Um, and this one is coming back as a $718,000 home. Um, you'll see this comes out in a data frame, which can then be modified and um, manipulated within the notebook. And just a second inference result here, this one's coming back as a $1.5 million home. So, um, then we'll run a batch inference. So again, I'm using some pre-prepared data here. I've got this file uh, in my repo. So I'm gonna run those thousand inferences and just grab the top five just to see what they look like. You'll see that was a pretty quick batch here. Um, 
our inferences generally are on the microsecond level of response. Sometimes performance is important, sometimes not so much. So um, let's take a look at what this distribution looks like for these thousand inferences um, as our baseline, essentially. So we'll see this. This is just a set of data that we prepared um, and wanted to show it here because now we're live in production, essentially. This can be used in a downstream application. It can be used in a batch process um, to store data in a database that gets referenced by an application, whatever the use case may be here. Um, and now I want to jump over into the UI to show you all how we set up drift detection. So that can happen in a notebook as well, but I wanted to use this as an excuse to jump over to our UI. Jeff, sorry, uh, one quick question that came in from Ruben. He asked, does this require the models to be in Python? Does this require using a notebook? And what about custom models in other languages? Um, we uh do support other frameworks i'm not necessarily sure about the python question um as long as the model can serialize into a format that we support i we don't care what uh what language it's in necessarily we uh do care about our python module steps so pre-processing post-processing within a pipeline those are python right now um, I'd be curious to talk more about specific use cases, though, because maybe there's an opportunity for us to expand our product offering there. Great. Uh, Ruben, we'll follow up with you directly after this, uh, after the call or after the webinar. Cool. Was there anything else before I jump over to the UI? Hector? Nope, sounds good. OK, cool. All right, so I'm going to jump over into the UI to introduce this to you all as well. Um, you will see I'm already in my workspace, House Price Demo Web. Told you it would come back up later. Um, and you can see here there's inviting collaborators. Um, we also have an internal Jupyter Hub, but in this case, we're using Azure Databricks, so we're ignoring that for now. And I can view my active pipelines here. So I'm going to jump over. And for the purposes of this, I'm actually going to use a separate pipeline than the one I just created, only because I needed to load historical data to establish our um, drift detection baseline. So I'm gonna click into our pipeline here. And here you'll see I have a specific house price assays model. Um, you can see version history and things like that. If I click over to my insights tab, this is actually where I can create an assay. And that is the term we use for uh, detecting like the quality of uh, how a model is performing. So I, if I click this create assay link um, and I'm gonna do house price, uh, drift. Um, I have some options to monitor output or input. Um, in this case, it's pulling the fields that I can monitor in, for output, and it's just the one uh, house price prediction field right now, and that is indexed at, at the zero position, so the field and the index. And if I click next, I can generate a baseline here. So as I said, I preloaded some historical data. Uh, I know that it's January 1st to January 2nd of this year, so if I apply that, it will generate a preview. And this is what the distribution looked like uh, on that day. So I am gonna use this as a baseline uh, for demo. You might have a, a, ba a different baseline. You might want to wait to establish the baseline if it's a brand new model, you don't really have anything. Um, you might wait a month before you establish a baseline, something like that. So if I click next, it will generate a preview here. Uh, it defaults to the, to the week after uh, the data I had put in. So um, these are each daily points of what our assay is measuring. So in this case, under our advanced settings, we're running every day at 1, 1 a.m. Um, we're grouping daily. We I think the, the important pieces here to look at are the metric you're using. So between uh, population stability index, maximum difference of bin, and sum of difference of bin, uh, you can use any one of these. These are the ones that we've got right now. So um, the difference here is that uh, the population stability index, for those that aren't familiar, um, is an entropy-based measure of the difference between the distributions. Uh, the maximum difference is about the maximum difference between the baselines, um, and the sum is the sum of those differences. So uh, we're going to use the population stability index here. You've also got some options around the number of bins. You can go up to 12 bins. Uh, right now we've got uh, quantile mode versus equally spaced and you can also do custom. We're gonna leave it on quantile. 
Um, and then bin weights, you can also custom weight the bins uh, for that. But for our purposes, we're going to leave it equally weighted. So once I finish and create my assay, this will generate here. Um, let me change our dates again. Uh, actually, let's do zero 02 and this will should still be calculating, I believe. So once this comes up, we should see some drift here. Mm -hmm. Let me do this though. Let me, there we go. So um, for uh, the assay generated here, and then we can see that uh, for our, the parameters we put in, we did detect drift for this period of time between the 14th and the 27th. So let's say that this is our impetus to say, you know what, we think we want to modify our model to handle situations like these. So we'll go back to our uh, experimentation environment in Databricks and work on tweaking this. So I'm going to hop back over to our notebook. And from here, uh, I'm going to presuppose that in experimentation, we have two models we'd like to consider to see if they perform better. And we can do that in production using a shadow deploy. So we've got an XGB model candidate and just a GBR model candidate here. So um, just like before, I've defined some ease of use variables here. You'll see I'm again referencing uh, my repo and workspace for the models. Um, so let me define those and again, upload them into Wallaroo. And here we've got our shadow deploy command, again, kind of all in one. So we're going to build our shadow deploy pipeline, adding a shadow deploy step using our original model. And then we're going to add the two challengers, the XGB and the GBR challengers, and deploy that all as one step. Should have clicked it before I said that. Um, typically, these take less than 45 seconds. Uh, so we, uh, but for larger models, it could take longer depending on the specifics of the model. Uh, but this will run and deploy for us. Um, give it one second here. That's not what we're supposed to see. All right, let me uh, free up some space real quick. So that's uh, actually our cluster uh, does not have space for this pipeline to deploy right now. That is what's going on. So let me, um, I'm going to pay no attention to the man behind the mirror. I'm going to undeploy our original pipeline here for a second. And while you're setting that up, uh, we had a follow-up question. What architecture do you deploy to Kubernetes? And that, that is correct, to Kubernetes on whatever cloud you're on or even on-prem. Um, yeah. And we can talk a little bit about Edge as well. Yeah, I saw, yeah, well, that's uh, getting set up. So yeah, I, I, I think I probably touched on this uh, one of the previous slides. But yeah, we deploy to uh, any of the three major clouds, uh, whether that be Azure, AWS, uh, or, or GCP. But yeah, we also, uh, in the enterprise edition, deploy to an on-premises or hybrid environment. And uh, there's also the edge. Uh, so edge deployments are becoming more and more uh, popular with uh, edge, edge AI, and uh, not just deploying to the edge, but also uh, you know, running those uh, uh, analytics at the edge as well uh, as the power of those devices uh, increases. So, uh, yeah, we we deploy to you know all those different environments. Sweet, thank you. Um, so I was able to deploy this once I freed up uh, the resources from the cluster. 
Um, and that was relatively quick, 1.87 seconds. So just to be clear, the, the cluster configuration is an infrastructure side of things. Typically, I don't believe most folks in this audience would, would be managing that, and we would not be running into that uh, in production. We would have uh, warnings and make sure our cluster is sized appropriately. So this one is just a demo cluster, so I apologize for that hiccup. So let's look at our shadow results then to jump back in. So we've got our three models in the pipeline. I'm going to run a single um, a single test here. It is a data frame input, so you are able to send things in in a familiar format. Um, and you'll see this is the same one that we originally ran with, so you might recognize the 718,000 number. Um, and our GBR model comes back with about 705, and our XGB model uh, is about 660. So let's see over time, let's say we've got a thousand inferences here. We're gonna run that and see what that looks like. But we can then use these inferences to analyze which one's actually performing better. Um, certainly in this space, I'm not gonna look at it here, but you've probably got tools already, whether it's Tableau or Grafana or whatever um, analysis tools, and we support exporting this so that that analysis can be done. Um, and then we can make a decision on which model do we really wanna um, get back into production because it's performing better. So let's say from this, we say, uh, okay, great. We want to uh, make our XGB model our new production level model. So I'm gonna go back to our original pipeline um, and swap that in. So one, I need to undeploy the shadow pipeline to get the resources back, but normally I would just do this to, uh, yeah, clean up what we're doing so we don't have deployed pipelines using resources we don't need. And I'm also, I'm gonna wait for this to undeploy, but, and then I do need to deploy again. Hector, we got any question, Any more questions while we're waiting? Yeah, but a couple other ones. One is, uh, how does this work for Databricks on GCP and AWS? Um, right now, uh, we haven't yet had interest in Databricks for those other clouds. If you do have interest, come talk to us. Uh, but we support their other notebook environments. So we do support AWS SageMaker and Vertex AI today. Okay. Next questions. Do containers have model parameters inside them or are they fed parameters during inference? Model parameters. So the model would be pre-trained and like uh, packaged is, is an overloaded term there um, and saved in a as a model artifact. So the parameters wouldn't be variable at the time of inferencing. Are we talking about variable inputs then or I might be missing the question here. Uh, we'll see if we uh, get a response from that. Um, and then is there any limit to the type of model framework supported? Um, yes, there is. Uh, that is probably a better conversation for, uh, or a, a better viewing of documentation. Uh, today, we support native runtime in um, Onyx and TensorFlow. So it's really about converting models into those frameworks. Um, we are actively working on right now um, auto conversion from additional frameworks so that that conversion doesn't have to happen before it gets to Wallaroo. So we do have support for like Keras getting into TensorFlow, um, XGB getting to Onyx. We are streamlining that process. So we're looking at um, PyTorch and Hugging Face in addition to the, the few that I've mentioned. Um, even within Hugging Face, though, there were were taking on um, different use cases one by one. So it's not it won't be wholesale Hugging Face. It'll be iterative. So again, as hopefully you've you've heard, I would love to hear from you guys about which ones you're thinking about, um, so that we can think about them too on all fronts. And folks, we'll yeah, be yeah. following up with several of you uh, directly. Um, so that's a, another great way to go talk to our sales engineers directly with your own use cases, your own architecture, um, and specific questions. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, sorry. Just uh, on the question of uh, you know GCP and AWS, uh, you know Jeff mentioned uh, we have documentation. Uh, up on if you go to docs.wallaroo.ai uh, and uh, so within there where we have uh, those uh, tutorials that help you 
you know, go through that the setup and configuration along with uh, the uh, Azure Databricks and also Azure ML environments. And then also on the topic of um, model uh, conversion, we have a number of different model conversion tutorials there as well, and we've converted them into videos. So if you go back to the YouTube channel, uh, we have uh, videos as well as the documentation to show you how to step through uh, those uh, environments. Okay. So uh, follow up, Jeff and Martin, on that question around uh, model parameters. Uh, this the question um, the asker had a few more follow ups. If you yeah. deploy to Kubernetes, I'm assuming you're using co containers. If you're using containers, they will need model artifacts. Are containers built with these artifacts inside them, or do you feed the artifacts through Kubernetes to these containers? Um, so we sometimes use containers. If it's a native runtime, um, I guess we are using containers of some sort uh, there as well. But no, the, the artifacts are in the containers. So part of our conversion process, if we need to containerize, when we upload, the, the model artifacts are, are uh, put in containers at that time and then stored within Wallaroo to be deployed when the pipeline is deployed. Okay. We'll just give it another minute or so, see if any other, um, if any other questions come in. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah, to... I can hop back into the demo here. So I was able to get my pipeline deployed again my original pipeline so just to show you all uh that it is back up and running i want to run this inference here um and it is running here's my house price pipeline and it's using my housing v1 um and again to reground us we're going to swap out for my xgb model um uh, because we thought that it was running better right so here we have uh again our single step replaced with model step so we're replacing our zeroth index step with our challenger 01 which is our xgb and i'm going to deploy that and instead of my 718 here we will see a different number i think it's the 660 yeah so here's the 660 um and you can see that the model has changed within the same pipeline so with that we have now iterated through our first model we wanted to change it, we found a better model, and we deployed it uh, all live uh, while things were running. So with that, that's the end of the demo here. I am going to undeploy this, like I said, to give resources back to the cluster, um, but otherwise, we are good. And so I am going to hand it back over to Martin, unless there are more questions we want to take right now, Hector. No questions right now. All right. Martin, coming to you. Back to me. All right. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, uh, good demo. Uh, things happen sometimes, you know. <laughs> I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's great to get these questions. Really appreciate uh, that engagement. And so, uh, you know, these are the, the environments that, uh, you know, data scientists and ML engineers you know, face on that day-to-day -day basis. Like, you know, I, I create my model in a, a certain format, you know, how do I, uh, you know, get that into the format that is needed for production? And, uh, and then where do I deploy it? You know, if I'm running on a cloud, you know, on-premise or, or at the edge, you know, is that, you know, capability available to me? And so what we saw from the demo is uh, essentially when you go through that environment that uh, you're familiar with in Azure Databricks, you know, to, you know, you know, load, you know, prep your data, uh, uh, build uh, that uh, that model ideation, and then through to developing uh, those models, and uh, and then you know taking them uh, right through uh, seamlessly into production, and so you know deploying in a matter of seconds, uh, you know observing them as well, making sure that you know are they performing the way they're intended to, and so in a case like the uh, house pricing one, you know we've seen. Uh, you know, with interest rates changing uh, and, the, you know, the global economy, and some of those models are probably, you know, uh, well off uh, from what they were maybe, you know, 12, 18 months ago. And so that's important for, you know, folks in that environment, you know, whether it would be a, you know, batch uh, mode or if you're uh, streaming, uh, maybe in a credit card fraud environment, it's super important for uh, those teams to be able to have tools in the familiar environment that they can 
uh, uh, observe your models so that they can take that actionability uh, on them. And uh, and as we saw from uh, the demo, you know, we can hot swap that in production without you know uh, degrade uh, sort of taking down the environment or or dehydrating uh, that environment and then having to start all over again. That continuity uh, is built in uh, to that integration capability. And so uh, just uh, I know we had some great questions there and uh, you know fantastic and really appreciate everybody that that asked them. Uh, any other questions, Hector, in the queue that we can answer uh, before uh, we? Yes. We one more, which is, uh, so it would be like one model per container. So if we have a thousand models, we have a thousand containers. I don't know, Jeff, if you can talk a little bit more about like our, our pipeline paradigm for models versus just I, standard. I don't know the the scaling on the, the back end or how that works. I think we'd have to ask engineering on that one. Okay. So we'll we'll follow up with uh, engineering. And again, just a reminder, we'll we'll be following up with uh, everyone who asked a question on this call, and, and we'll um, with uh, engineering to provide more more of those details. And that's it on the question front. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, folks, uh, again, appreciate your time and joining us. Appreciate the, the questions and engagement. And uh, you know we have a, a host of information. If you go to wallaroo.ai, we have our blogs. Uh, we have uh, you know other information up there, and uh, we also have a free community edition. You can download and try that for yourself, and go through the tutorials uh, that are on our uh, docs page. And uh, as I mentioned previously, we are recording this, and we'll put this up to our YouTube channel uh, along with the other videos that we have. And one other thing that we do as part of the community is every couple of weeks I run a 30 minute you know, quick deep dive tech talk. And so within that tech talk, uh, we uh, get into a specific topic and we go pretty deep on that one. And again, we keep that uh, interactive and, and fairly casual as well for the community. So have a look out if you're up on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, I, you know, look for me uh, posting this, or if you want to follow uh, Wallaroo.ai, uh, you can see when the next tech talk is coming, and uh, and uh, you know, become uh, you know, engaged in that as well. Nothing left for me to say. I just again, thanks very much. I know uh, there's a lot of things competing for your time, and if you have any follow-up questions, we do have community at Wallaroo.ai as an email that you can reach out to us and ask questions. I know sometimes when you get off a call, you're like, oh, I should have asked this question, you know. But yeah, so that is available to you. And uh, we'd love to hear from you, hear about your use cases and uh, how you're applying AI and ML into production as well. So on behalf of me, thanks very much, uh, Jeff, uh, as well, my colleague, uh, Hector and Jordan. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar next month. And uh, thanks again, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.